Good morning, everybody, uh, and, and thanks for turning out in such numbers. Uh, so on with today's event. Uh, I think, you know, for the last two or three months, as an industry, we've been working tremendously hard on dealing with, I guess, the, the consequences of the CEA report, but helicopter safety in terms of what HSSG is doing and HTG did before that has been ongoing as part of the step change agenda for some time. And I think today gives us a sense of just an update on where we're at with some really important topics. We've got the benefit, I think, and Mark Swan from CEA is with us today. Mark is, uh, I can't remember your title, Mark, it's on my notes, I'll get there. Was it Safety Aviation, Safety and Aerospace Regulation, Regulation Group Director? Mark has to leave, unfortunately, right on half past nine today because he's got an equally important meeting later on this afternoon. So please bear with us. Uh, you know, use that time in the Q&A to give Mark the warmth and welcome from the offshore industry. We also have Tim and Alan here. He'll give you an update on what uh, HSSG has been up to, what we're doing, and some of the key projects that are ongoing. It's really important again today to use the information in the breakout groups. We have the, you know, we've been working very hard to give you breakout groups that we think are important. So an update on what we're doing with the emergency breathing system. We know that we've got to deliver something as soon as possible. We know everybody's interested in that. And what we have is some prototype product for you to, to see and, and give you a sense of just how far that group's gone. We've also got the size and shape group passenger size, which gives us a sense of one of the other recommendations in the report. And what we want you to do is tell us how we're going to meet that. So we'll give you an update as to where we're at, but really it's important for us to get the feedback. And today is much, is much about dialogue, so listening to you, listening to what you've got to say. The challenge of managing passenger size that is, is a huge challenge for us, if you forgive the pun, and we absolutely need your help in how to meet that. We also have an update from Airbus helicopters on the EC225 gear shaft. Again, that's been a long journey for us from May 2012 through till now. Lots of work gone on and we've kept you up to date right through that, so we'll give a chance to give you an update on that. And then, for some reason, we decided that we weren't effective enough at communications, so we want you to tell us how to get better. So, you know, we're going to do a lot less talking perhaps today than normal. We really want you to give us feedback as to how to improve what we're doing, not just in the helicopter safety space, but in general within step change. So we'd really appreciate that. I think finally, just you know, the usual thanks to, to Bill Finger Salamis. These events, as you can see, we're kind of pretty much sold out today. Continue to be you know, oversubscribed, continue to present challenges as to how to get enough space in a room. Unfortunately, you know, we've got it set up theater style, so you don't have the benefit of nice big tables and water and suites in front of you but we're only in here for a short period of time, so you know, it's just life, I'm afraid. The reality for us is that having a sponsor helps us do this and make it uh, viable. Use the Q&A panel session for your advantage. That's what it's there for. It's not for me, it's not for these guys, it's for you. You've got colleagues, representatives as, as your safety committees that are desperate to have information. The slides will be available later today on the website. The whole thing will be videoed so that you can get it and share it at site. So what we're trying to do is give you everything we possibly can. Without further ado, I'll introduce Mark, the Safety Airspace Regulation Director from CEA. Mark. up if the slide deck can be activated. Well, good morning, everybody, and um, thank you very much indeed to Les and the co-chairs uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to come and speak to you, which uh, I'm really, really grateful for. And uh, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time on slides because, as Les has already said, we'll get a lot more out of the, the Q&A session, and I can actually stay till 10, so uh, please collar me um, if, if, if you want to grab me on a particular issue. So I'm going to just spend a quick 10 minutes, kind of, I hope, debunking a few myths, um, go through our perspective of the whole program, and then really the, the, the real value will be in, in the questions and answers. Um, quick two minutes on my background. Um, I was a military pilot for 30 years, uh, flown many thousands of hours in the North Sea, mainly in fixed-wing aircraft, but I have bobbed up and down in my dinghy in the North Sea many, many times on training. I've also done the underwater escape training, so I know what it's like. 
uh, and I know what the North Sea can be like as an environment. So just a bit of background for me. I joined the CAA, the Civil Aviation Authority, five years ago, took over the airspace side of things, and then uh, last year in July was asked to merge two groups, safety and airspace, into one. So I now have the whole portfolio for aviation safety at the national and international level, as well as airspace uh, regulating the skies above. So that, that's me. In terms of what we have tried to do with this report, I mean, I think this, this for me kind of says it all. We all want to work with colleagues here to make a big step change in the safety of the aviation system, and it is a system, it's not just about the helicopter, that gets your folks uh, to their work and back. Um, that's an unusual way to travel for people. It's not a bus service. It is fragile in some areas. It is very taut in others. And our review was designed to look at, as, as those of you who have read it, the whole spectrum of that system and how it operates. And we came up with a lot of recommendations. So I'm just going to talk you through some of those recommendations this morning. A couple of high-level points. I'm the aviation safety regulator. The whole of the CA exists to help with safety and make sure in this particular instance that your folk are as safe as they can be, and that's not as safe as safe, safe as they can be, as safe as they need to be to get to work and do their jobs and back again. Um, why the big review? Well, that's obvious to everybody in the room. You know, tragic accidents uh, last year really galvanized us to redouble our efforts in terms of just looking at the whole system. You know, what can we possibly do to add value, make this safer, and, and I'll stress again, but you know, work with folk like this, because we're not, we're not going to impose all this on people. We, can't, we don't know the answers. We can't come up with all the solutions. We need to work with the folk that really know this business and yourselves to make the system as safe as, as it can be, or as it needs to be, for you to be able to do your job. And uh, so we did a lot of uh, evidence gathering. It was a pretty tight time scale. I was very keen that we got something out there quickly. Uh, because we felt that was really necessary. There's been a bit of criticism around the bazaars saying, well, you know, you should have consulted with A or B and C, and you should have done more. Well, that would have taken another two or three months. And um, it has also been pointed out, we didn't put the report out to consultation, which is a normal regulatory practice. Uh, we didn't do that because these were safety-critical recommendations that we wanted to get out there. My contention is we're now in consultation. So the way we're working with consultation is having set up some of these groups to now get the right people in the room and work with you guys to get the best result that we possibly can. So what does that mean? Apologies for this kind of busy slides, but I thought it was important to give you a bit of a, a, bit of a feel for where we are in all this. And I, I, haven't got a, I haven't got a laser pointer, but don't worry. But look, what, what this is saying to you, SARG is the Safety and Airspace Regulatory Group. I'm the guy at the top of that, and down the left-hand side of this, you'll see my team. And what we've set up to deliver this, to give you an idea of our commitment to you, is a project portfolio board over two years. We've got a new head of airworthiness, who's a helicopter and a fixed-wing pilot, so he knows the business. A new head of uh, air, uh, sorry, that's flight ops. A new head of airworthiness, John McCall, who'll be working with uh, Airbus and the technical folk and the like. And then we've got the strategy and policy people working with the ASA, the European Safety Agency, to really drive forward some of the ASA recommendations uh, that are in the program. Then we've got a bunch of working groups with some real experts uh, over, over time. We've got some helicopter pilots who've actually uh, flown in the North Sea and carried you guys. Some have worked there for 12 years, now work for me. And then we've got the delivery teams down the bottom. But critically, the bit I want to draw your attention to is up here. We set up what we're calling the OSAG, the Safety Action Group, and, and I really want to stress that is not a competitor to, it is a collaborative agent of and with all of the other superb groups that exist. One is here in this room today, there's the HSSG, there's all sorts of other committees that know your business much better than I ever can, and we will be working with those groups and through those groups to deliver the optimum safety benefits that we can. And I think that's a really important point for me to get across. And you'll see from the folk in the room, uh, you know, these are people that know this business and they'll be working with us to deliver those changes. Sitting down here, 
is kind of where the action is. So we've set up two, they say subgroups, that doesn't mean they're secondary, they will just report into that central committee. And you'll see that my new head of flight ops and airworthiness, so kind of CAA chaired, but really that is facilitation, brokering, working in partnership with the others in these teams to deliver the results that you want from us over the next couple of years. So it is really a, a collaborative effort. And the reason for setting these up and going into this amount of detail and this amount of commitment is because it's quite clear to everybody that with recommendations like this, the devil is in the detail. Okay, and I know we're gonna talk about size and shape, and I know there's a lot of um, emotion going on over EBS, and we're gonna hear more about that today. You know, it is right that we get people in the room to talk about these things, find a pathway through that satisfies the safety benefits and the outcomes that we all want to achieve. And there are, you know, there are issues around that, and I know we're gonna explore those today. But these teams are the folk they're going to be working together to deliver through you the outcomes that we want to achieve from the report itself. It is a collaborative effort. Okay, so in terms of um, what that means, just very briefly, I'm not going to go through all this, but the point is, this isn't just about a couple of safety things. You know, it's not about sticking plaster to say, having a bit of breathing equipment uh, because you'll be able to survive longer underwater, you know, sea state six, let's calm that down. This is a full program of work over two years that is gonna look at every single aspect of the system that is getting folk from A to B in a safe and effective manner. So it is, as you can see from this portfolio of work that we've broken down, it is all about pilot training, pilot performance, it's about the engineering, we've got some of the manufacturers and the design folk in the room today. It's a big piece of work and I, I really want to kind of give you that context. It's not just about the shorter term plan, which is get better emergency uh, e equipment into the aircraft so that we, we give you the best um, survivability stuff up front. But it's about that longer term, just tuning up the system safety and making it as best as it can be for uh, your folk to travel. And let me also say, and I've said this to the, uh, to the helicopter folk and to the Transport Select Committee, I had a, an hour and a half before the Transport Select Committee two weeks ago, you know, if I thought, if we thought as, as, as the guardians of safety for, for the UK, if we thought for one minute that any of those helicopter operations were inherently unsafe, I promise you they would be grounded right here and now. That is not the case. So for folk who say, well, you know, they're flying and it's really unsafe and da da da, that is not the case. You know, we would have no hesitation whatsoever to put folk on the ground if we weren't happy with the way these operations are running. So this is about you know, taking better note of what the risk factors are and just trying to alleviate those risks so that they don't happen in the first place wherever we can. Okay, please don't despair over this. This is just to reinforce my point. Two slides and then it will all be over. But just to say, there is a full program of work here. So every little green dot, square, whatever you want to call it, against the plan on the left. So I've designed these slides so you can take them away and just have a look at them. We've got a good governance setup, of, as I've explained. But look, there's a whole bunch of uh, analysis on flight data management, on air traffic control stuff, on all the operational issues, including human performance. I'm sure we're going to talk about this one. Bear in mind, this is a one-year program and nobody has dictated what the answer is yet. And we'll come back to that in a second. And then, again, just concentrating you down the left, we're looking at helidex, we're looking at pilot performance and training. You know, if the pilot isn't getting it right, then clearly he needs to. And so there's a whole pipeline of work just to make sure that we're satisfied that the pilot performance and training is as good as it needs to be to get your folk from A to B. And then down here, and this is really the, the kind of two working groups I talked about, there's a whole bunch of stuff on the aircraft themselves. You know, helicopters aren't like fixed wing aircraft, you know, jet engines round and round, A to B, time and time again. There's a lot more moving parts, and so we need to pay a bit more attention to how, how those are being put together and how they're working. So big program of work in terms of milestones for delivery. And these encapsulate the kind of 70 odd recommendations that are in the report if you've had the opportunity to read it. Okay, so how do we in the CAA um, 
make these sort of things effective? Well, at the national level, it is within our power and gift to impose a safety directive on the helicopter operators and say, you shall do this by then in the interest of safety. And so we've prepared a draft safety directive, so it's not finalized yet, and it will cover these things in the short term. Sea state six, you know about. The emergency floating system, I'm not going to talk about it now because we'll come back to that in q and I'm sure. And passenger seating and Cat A EBS is the hot topic, um, which is kind of swamping the overall program. Perfectly understandable why, and that'll be of primary interest to you folk this morning. I'm, I, I'm pretty clear on that. But it is a two-way dialogue. So although we've prepared, prepared the ops directive, you know, Work is still ongoing. Uh, Les didn't kind of give away the fact that the meeting I'm going to this afternoon is with the senior uh, oil and gas executives, uh, UK and nationally, with the oil and gas board, with my board and my chief executive, and we're going to talk some of this stuff through. So that happens later on this afternoon. What else? We're going to come back to that, so I'll just, uh, I'll just go over that. But look, passenger size. Um, let me slay a few myths right now. I think... The key point is bullet number four. You, you, know our business, you know your business better than me, right? So we're going to advise and assist. We're looking for the industry to come up with the optimum solution that you feel is going to make your people safe in terms of getting out of these helicopters, right? That doesn't necessarily mean, and we're not going to do this, we're not going to impose anything here. We're going to look for an industry solution that is the safest and the least riskiest. So. You could do that one. Everybody in the helicopter has to get out the smallest exit. That's probably not right. The most complex one, there is a system, a vantage system, that says, you sit there, you go out of that one, da 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 That's another way of doing it. In the longer term, you can have bigger exits. The, the, there are plenty of things around. The optimum solution, as with all these things, is kind of, you know, somewhere here. But look. We've got a year to figure this out, okay? We, when we did the report, it, it would be crazy, it would be stupid for me to just go, as of tomorrow, here's a prohibition. That's no way to manage risk, okay? So we're looking for industry solutions. We'll be working with the folks in Step Change, HSSG and others to come up with that best solution so that everybody can get out of the helicopter. Okay. We don't know what the answer is yet. And we're just, we, we, our contribution here is a lot of data gathering. Uh, you probably know about the Robert Gordon um, study that's going on. A lot of your folk are being uh, looked at at the moment. It's a good thing to do. Okay? At the end of the day, we want people to be safe in their job and at their place of work. That's what it's all about. Okay, and uh, 2nd of July, we're hosting a big safety management symposium. So we're going to go through top 20 issues in terms of hazards, the mitigations and safety performance indicators, which is just a methodology for us to measure what success looks like when, it, when it's all put together, okay? Uh, so that's one of the big things that's going on in addition to you know, this remarkable meeting here. I mean, I was absolutely uh, dumbfounded to see how, how many of these conferences you guys have, how many turn up. I've got a big conference coming up in May. I've got 120 people. You know, it's once a year thing. So. So this is just brilliant uh, that you have this level of engagement. I can't match it, I'm afraid. And so some of the things we're looking at, just again to go back to this point, there's a big overall system program of safety. So you'll see here, uh, we're looking at pilot performance and training. We want to make sure that we're happy, that your pilots are the best that they can possibly be. And if we can help with sharing best practice, getting new stuff out, particularly for some of the new helicopters on automation, that sort of thing. What is a modern cockpit like? You know, how can you make the best out of it? And does that help tune up your safety performance? We want to look at that. We're going to look at the instructor requirements. So going right back to basics, you know, modern helicopters are like the fighters I used to fly. They are highly complex, highly automated um, aircraft. And they require people to have different skills. And maybe they even had 10 years ago or learn how to get the optimum use out of, your, out of your kit. So we're going to be looking at all that with the experts, with the pilots themselves, and with the instructors. And in terms of the airworthiness, so the engineering type stuff, 
Uh, we're going over some of the uh, things we've done in the past. We've set up a new maintenance standards team. And um, British Airways have very kindly uh, agreed to have a couple of meetings in terms of sharing best practice from one of our biggest commercial national carriers on their engineering approaches to certain things, how they do stuff, and just see how helpful that may be. And if it is helpful, we'll do more of it. So this is all about learning and sharing very openly in the interest of safety. And uh, last but not least, by any means least, you know, the European Safety Agency are key to a lot of the, because they now own the design and certification of these machines, they are key to success. So I've spoken with the new chief executive of um, EASA, Patrick Key, and his leadership team, and Patrick is committed to these recommendations, and, and his team are as well. So we, have, we will have EASA representation on the uh, committees I showed you earlier when, uh, when it's appropriate to do so. MOR, uh, you, you should be aware, mandatory occurrence reports, so they're the, the reports that need to be filed when something goes wrong, and we're looking at how we can make more of those and have a better plan to get the best information to make sure that we understand you know, what's gone wrong in the past doesn't get repeated in the future. Quick canter through. Um, I hope that's been helpful. Um, I just, again, want to reiterate that you know your business better than me. This is a collaborative program of work. We've set out some quite good timescales, I think. If you think you know, the EBS timescale is actually two years, the emotion is about the restriction in seating, which is a mitigation to that plan. But this is, this is changing and moving rapidly. If, um, and, you know, a lot of people said a lot of things to me as we launched the report last February. Um, we're kind of one and a half months later on. Look where we've got to. And I can kind of see the kit sitting there. So it's amazing what we can do collectively if we really put our minds to it. And there's still five weeks to go. And there's a lot of meetings in hand. And so there's a lot of stuff to do. Um, so that's my pitch. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Really look forward to the questions and answers. And so I've got half an hour at the end. I don't have to be back at the airport uh, till a bit later. So if you want to collar me, by all means, I'm, I'm here for you. So please do. Thank you. Good morning everyone, Alan Chesterman, co-chair of HSSG. I work for Apache, one of the largest operators in the North Sea. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk, there's going to be some repetition here, so we'll skip through some of these things because Mark has gone through a lot of it already. Uh, but obviously one of the big things that's happened uh, for HSSG has been the CAA review, has a huge impact on what we do, and a lot of our job is about communicating what's in it. One of the other things that we were already doing as a result of kind of what happened last year in the HSSG is that the meetings had got very, very large. We had some meetings last year with over 50 people. And uh, one of the things we wanted to do was thought, well, that's not right. And also the, the balance of oil and gas guys and helicopter guys in the HSSG wasn't right. You know, there were too many, too, frankly, there were too many oil and gas guys and there weren't enough helicopter guys and we've fixed that. So we've reformed the HSSG, had our first uh, meeting of the new shape on the 20th of March, and now it's about 50% helicopter guys and 50% oil and gas guys. We've got excellent represent, senior represent, representation from the heli all the helicopter operators, most of the, uh, all the big helicopter manufacturers. We've got the regulators, we've got the CAA and the HSE. We've got the unions. Uh, and trade associations and, and guys from the Oil and Gas UK. And it's, it's a different group from what it used to be. The balance is fixed. It's much more action-oriented, and it's the right sort of size. Uh, and as I said, we had our first meeting on the, on the 20th of March. And it had a very business-like feel to it uh, and a feel to it about getting things done and getting things in the right order and the right priority. So, just to report on some of the things that we did at that last meeting. First of all, we had updates on the status of the CAA review and the CAA safety forum, this uh, new forum that Mark heads up. Uh, so we had reports in for those. Last year, we set up the, the 
HTG, the helicopter task group, to, to deal with all the issues that came out of the, the Sunborough accident. Um, the work of that group is now done. There are only a few actions there remaining, and we've closed that group down. And the actions that are remaining from that are come back into the HSSG. The next thing, we've formed a new work group to move forward the new rebreathers. So, so we need a new rebreather for the, for the North Sea that's, uh, that's more usable, can be deployed more quickly. We've got the work group here today who are going to talk about that. That's one of the sessions later on. We've also formed a new work group to look at the passenger size issue that Mark was just talking about. How we're going to deal with this uh, passenger size compatibility with the size of the exits, different sizes of exits on different aircraft, um, all sorts of different solutions. So we've set that up, and we know that everybody wants the answers on that question right now, and we don't, we don't have them yet. And the other thing that we're doing is we had a big action list of potential projects to, to do with helicopter safety, and now we've had the CAA review. So we need to integrate the two together, look at our activity set, and focus on the right things and who's doing what. And that activity review is in progress right now. So I'm not going to go over this slide. We're going to, I'm just going to amplify some of the things that Mark <coughs> said and get a key message across. So this was a huge thing for HSSG, the, the, the um, CAA safety review, Capital M45. Um, Mark has explained you know, that, that, that those guys were under a lot of pressure to get it out quickly. There wasn't the degree of, degree of consultation that we, that we were used to in oil and gas, but we can understand the reasons for that. The role of HSSG in in this is, first of all, that we've got the new Helicopter Safety Forum and we have um, a, a chap on, who sits on the forum. Also, some of the guys who are a part of HSSG are also part of the forum. <coughs> Our role is really to communicate and facilitate these issues and those are the Joint Operators Review. So Tim's going to talk in a minute about the Joint Operators Review. After Sumbra, the main operators set up their own review to look at how they operate, how they maintain integrity of aircraft. And Tim's going to talk a little bit about that piece of work. We're, our role is also to communicate and engage with the offshore workforce, so about the passenger size, about the EBS. And we'll work with Oil & Gas UK, the operators, and CAA to determine how best is to proceed. So we've been doing a lot of figuring out and you know, we weren't sure exactly how everything would work. It's beginning to come together now. And, we, you know, obviously we want to move this forward quickly and communicate to all the people offshore who are wondering what it means for me. So I just want to amplify a few things that Mark has said because of what's happened in the last two months since the report was published. Um, so joint, joint review was undertaken by the UK and uh, CAA with... Norway CAA also participated. It, it started in October. It delivered in February. It was very fast. It's a huge report. It's almost 300 pages long. And there are something like 60 actions and recommendations addressing both prevention and mitigation. And my, my key message for today is that most of the report is about prevention. And a lot of the focus in the press and the talk out and the platforms is about mitigation. A helicopter goes in the sea, it rolls over. How do people survive from that? But that's not what most of the report is about. So it is about prevention as well as mitigating measures. So if we talk about mitigating measures, emergency breathing systems, passenger size, um, helicopter stability in, you know, Mark was talking about the will, the, will the helicopter roll over? What's the maximum sea state that it can stay upright? Those are all about what happens when it goes in the water. Only 10 of the recommendations are about what happens when it goes in the water. 51 of the recommendations are about prevention. And if we look at the accidents since 2006, two fatal accidents have been caused by operational factors. One fatal accident has been caused by technical failure. And there have been three ditchings, two due to technical failure and one due to operational factors. And what do we mean by operational factors? You know, we work on the offshore platforms. We've got operational factors. It's about people, procedures, experience, competence, um, technical factors, 
we talk about asset integrity in our platforms. It's the same analogy with helicopters. So in fact, there are 25 prevention measures under operational factors. There are 20 measures to prevent technical failure, and there are six general measures to do with <coughs> preventing the aircraft from, from ditching or, or crashing. So, you know, that's my key message for today. The most, most of the work, everything that Mark's, you know, most of what Mark's been talking about is about prevention. So, here's a few of these, and I'm, I'm not going to go through these because uh, Tim has been talking about them. Um, uh, Mark's already been talking on some of them, so we don't want to repeat ourselves, but uh, I'll hand over to Tim. Okay. Thanks, Alan. Hi, my name is uh, Tim Glassball, a fellow co-chair of uh, HSSG. I'm also head of flight operations for Bristol Helicopters, and I'm also a current EC225 pilot. Um, as we've been talking, uh, trying to get more of the message across today about the uh, preventative measures that are in uh, CAT 1145, which are really aimed at preventing the accident in the first place. Now, there's, so there's two phases to it. You've got the uh, immediate actions, where we know that helicopters can ditch because it has happened, so there are immediate preventative measures or mitigation measures to deal with that, and that's the bit we'll be coming on to later with the CAT EBS and size and shape. And then there's the much more forward-looking uh, preventative measures where we're actually uh, looking to address the whole design concept of the helicopters uh, and the, the training concepts, make sure we're actually training for the right things. So as uh, Alan was saying, we sort of split it into a couple of different, uh, or two different areas. On the operational factors, you can see that we're looking at uh, pilot training, making sure we uh, train for the appropriate things. Um, it's interesting, again, there have been some developments fairly recently, uh, looking at the, the, tri the pilot training programs. These are slightly experimental, um, but there are certain rote things that we always train for as pilots, such as engine failures and fires, that we have to do every single time that we go in the simulator, and yet these are things that don't actually happen very often, and nowadays the consequences, particularly with the North Sea helicopter fleet, of something like that happening are relatively minor, believe it or not. The, uh, you know, the aircraft are powerful enough that if an engine failed, the other engine just takes up the load. In fact, in my experience, when I've actually had to uh, deliberately shut down an engine in flight many years ago, the passengers didn't even notice, and if I hadn't told them, they wouldn't have known. So when you've got that level of consequence, are we actually training appropriately uh, by spending so much time training for these emergencies, or should we change the focus and look at other things? And this is the kind of stuff that we're really starting to dig into now and, uh, and look at. So there's the, you know, the pilot training, operating procedures, uh, how we structure the, uh, you know, the, the checks and tests that pilots have to go through every six months, and looking at the, uh, the crew interaction, human factors issues, how well the crew work together as a team, how well the checklists work, how well they interact with the aircraft. You know, these are, as Mark was saying, they're very, very complex machines, particularly the newer aircraft, and the human-machine interface is a very key part of that, actually understanding what the aircraft is telling you about what's happening within it. Uh, it sounds pretty straightforward, but uh, it can be very, very confusing if you don't completely understand the philosophy of that particular manufacturer. And there's no standard form on this. It does, these philosoph philosophies do uh, change between the different manufacturers. So uh, there's a whole change in the way that we view training for pilots and the level of detail that they have to be aware of. And on the airframe integrity side, um, Similar kind of thing. We're looking at how we maintain. Are the maintenance programs appropriate? Are they historic? Uh, are we actually maintaining things that, uh, you know, according to the reliability data, or just changing them because that's the way we've always done it? So there's all sorts of fairly, you know, very high-level major reviews going on uh, across the whole helicopter industry. Looking at some of the prevention measures, um, these are more of the uh, the aircrew side looking at the different training. Again, there's, there's lots of work groups being set up. These are all things that are not going to give immediate results, but we're already starting to see some of the benefits and the way we're talking about things. And you know, the, the piece of paper is essentially blank, uh, and we're starting to look at what we actually need to do rather than what we've been doing over the years. Uh, and again, on the airframe, the, uh, on that side as well, the technical side, there's a whole range of, of different issues that we're, we're looking at. Uh, in one of the interesting concepts the CAA have come up with, which is obvious when you think about it, is uh, taking something from the fixed-wing world, which is now fairly established, which is the, the ability to fly 
twin-engine aircraft across the Atlantic. You know, we think nothing of jumping into a, a twin-engine plane and flying thousands of miles over the sea. But to get to the point where we were able to do that was quite a long journey. And it's actually a, there's a whole category of regulation to do with the, you know, extended twin-range operations, you know, ETOPS, to allow that to happen. And it was involved looking at the reliability of various critical systems on the aircraft, making sure there were sufficient backups available, making sure the maintenance programs addressed that level of reliability, and making sure that the chance of anything actually happening on the aircraft that would require it to ditch or divert was so small that the risk was acceptable. And that's how we went from requiring four-engine aircraft to fly over the Atlantic to two-engine aircraft flying over the Atlantic. That same philosophy is now going to be applied to operating helicopters over hostile terrain. So the North Sea is hostile. And it's this kind of in-depth review of all the individual items, all the components and interactions of the different systems on a helicopter to see where the weaknesses are and ensure that we have uh, appropriate resilience to cover, manage those weaknesses, um, or even remove the weaknesses so that we have a far, far better uh, system for operating over hostile terrain. Not going to happen overnight, but it's a, it's a very worthwhile aim and something that we'll, we'll be working very hard on for the next few years. See, these are the kinds of things that uh, very likely in 10 years' time, probably not the, the current generation of helicopters, but the next generation of helicopters will have a lot of this, these systems and ideas built into them uh, and will render the mitigation requirements that we're currently uh, working through no longer necessary because the whole point of this is to prevent helicopters going in the water in the first place and then, of course, you don't need all the mitigation measures. So following the, uh, the first CA safety forum, uh, there's uh, some general uh, items that came out of that. I mean, generally, the, you know, the CAA, to be commended for stepping up to the mark, certainly is uh, within the aviation industry, so it's very well supported. Um, and we're very much in favor of virtually, or essentially all the recommendations in CAT 1145. With the immediate issues the CAA are addressing, we have the, uh, the issue of uh, available seats per aircraft until CAT A EBS is available. Now, the uh, the onus was on the, uh, is on the operators to determine which seats would be available. Through discussion with the CAA, that's now being turned around, and the CAA will actually tell us which, how many seats per aircraft can be used. And that's essentially seats next to uh, an emergency pop-out window. So we'll be getting that data fairly soon. We've shared all the data on the size of the windows and the seating positions and everything else for all the aircraft with the CAA, and uh, we'll be finding out soon what the numbers are going to be. We've got a pretty good idea what they are because it's, it's fairly obvious. But uh, we just want some, some extremely you know, pure clarification to make absolutely sure that uh, we've got the numbers right. Again, sea state certification, that was originally an action on the operators. However, when, when we started speaking to the uh, OEMs, the manufacturers, they weren't especially keen to share that sort of certification level data with us since they'd also be sharing it with a number of other operators around the world and they would rather deal with regulatory authorities. And so the CAA took that over. So the CAA are now dealing with the OEMs. And again, we will find out what the uh, uh, sea state certification limits for each aircraft type will be before the uh, 1st of September when that particular limit comes in. Longer term, um, yeah, there's a lot of commitment from everywhere, from uh, operators, manufacturers, everybody involved to progress with the safety measures in the longer time frame. EASA have committed uh, and are very much on board with this process as well. Uh, and we'll talk through size and shape and uh, flight crew EBS later on. It's another interesting thing. Although all the, the fuss has been about passenger emergency breathing systems, there's also the uh, requirement for flight crew to have it as well. Uh, and in fact, we'll be bringing that in not long after or even simultaneous with the, uh, the passenger EBS as well. So the flight crew will be carrying the same system. Prior to the uh, uh, CAA review kicking off, we actually got together as a group of major helicopter companies to form the Joint Operators Review, looking at largely the same group of, uh, of factors and, and issues. So we've been, had a, a number of meetings between the, the three big operators, um, and uh, this reports directly to our individual CEOs, who as a group set this, uh, this whole uh, review up. And we've uh, had a, a fair bit of progress. We've been dealing with the, the manufacturers uh, on an individual basis, looking at uh, provision of, of data to us. It's a very interesting thing that if you buy uh, a Boeing 737 or an Airbus 320, when you buy the aircraft, you get a set of manuals, instructions, and training 
that are incredibly detailed as to how that aircraft should be operated, even down to what comments the crews should be saying to each other flying down an approach. Uh, when you buy a helicopter, you don't get any of that. You get the helicopter, here's the maintenance manual, here's how to switch it on and what will the systems do type manual. You don't get that, the extra bit in the middle. Uh, and that's what we've been asking for, and we certainly had commitment from, uh, certainly from Airbus, uh, that that is going to is going to be delivered uh, to us, and we're going to work with them and the other manufacturers to get this information. Again, it's quite a big job. It's going to take a year or two, uh, but uh, it will be a benefit to everybody that operates these helicopters in the future. We've been looking at uh, our different training programs, trying to get uh, best practice and share that. Uh, and also, we've been looking at uh, stabilized approach, which is a a concept which is difficult for helicopters is the point at which, as you're flying down an approach to a runway or a rig, um, you try to have it as stabilized as possible so that every approach is the same, so that both crew can uh, detect very easily whether it's uh, going wrong, whether your speed's deteriorating or you're descending too fast or any of those kind of parameters. If it's the same kind of approach every single time, it gets very, very easy to spot when it's uh, being done slightly differently or going slightly wrong but it's a very difficult thing to achieve for a helicopter since you're actually planning to come to a stop before you get to the bottom as well. So there has to be a speed reduction, and obviously you're descending, there has to be a height reduction, so it's creating all the different parameters uh, that you'd be looking at, and so we've been working together to, uh, to work on that as well. And now, just a quick bit about the EBS work group, and I'll hand back to Alan to, to finish us off. So, uh, obviously the, the time-pressing issues, one of them is this issue about the EBS. So everybody knows, I'm sure by now, that there is a recommendation in the CAA review that says that unless your helicopter has got side floats to stop it from rolling over, or unless you've got a category A EBS, you, can't, you have to be sat next to an exit. You can't sit in the inboard seats. So what is a category A AB, EBS? It's an EBS that you can deploy in 10 seconds. You can get the... Uh, <clears throat> you can breathe the air within 10 seconds and you, and you can put a nose clip on in 12 seconds and there are some other things as well. You can't do that at the moment with the present uh, rebreather type of bag. So we wanted to get these uh, get good EBS system that meets category A up and running as soon as possible. The number one objective is that it's a good, usable, easy to use EBS system. So we've set up a work group. It's led by Colin Griffiths. Is Colin, where are you? He's at the back there. He'll be speaking in a minute, and uh, we've got a breakout session. And these guys have uh, uh, clear objectives, identify, select, and test potential solutions, work with the PETA and training providers. So training is a, is a big issue around this. So we won't say any more than that right now. Group's been up and running six weeks, thereabouts. Been doing some excellent work progressing this. You'll hear more about it later. The other big one is the passenger size work group. So we've talked about that, a lot of issues around that. So that work group has been set up. We've got Alan Combe from BP and Lane McEwen from uh, Maersk. Um, sorry, Les. <laughs> um, working this issue. So, you know, it's, it's really only just got up and running. You'll hear more about it later. But the objectives include understanding, well, what does this really mean? What is the range of solutions? Uh, what are the issues around it? So they're really just getting going, and we'll hear more from them later. So delighted to have those two work groups up and running. You know, we're making some good progress on some of these issues. That's it. It's not the most complimentary photo, is it? But never mind. The funny thing was, 25 years ago when I first went offshore, I was in the median point of the uh, bell curve for weight. I'm still at the median point of the bell curve for weight. Unfortunately, that's two stone heavier than it was back then. So, you know, I'm in the right place, just the wrong shape. So I think, you know, I'd just like to thank these guys uh, for, for what they've done. I mean. My, my immediate reaction to listen, listening to that is, you know, we, we've had a sense of just how much is on the left-hand side of the risk challenge here and how we manage that and how we focused, you know, absolutely on the things on the right-hand side in terms of mitigation, but prevention and we've, you know, communicating that today has been really important. 
I'm really interested in the, the two passenger option, you know, the passenger size options that Mark uh, suggested. Uh, I'm sure you have got lots of opinions, and that's why you know you, know, you can share that with Elaine uh, and the guys in that group later. Uh, and I've probably got a question for Mark later, but I'll, I'll save that to see if anybody else asks it. So over to you folks, and just in terms of Q and A, this is your first opportunity. Just see who you are, Dave. <laughs> so everybody else knows you. <laughs> Thanks, Les. My name is Dave Clark. I'm a technical yeah. safety engineer. Um, I'm just curious. I've heard a lot about what you're saying about safety and maintainability, but have you carried out any RAMS analysis, reliability, availability, maintainability, and safety altogether? Sorry, I missed the first part of your question. What sort of analysis? RAMS. Uh, it's a term that's quite frequently used in other industries. So you're taking uh, an overall view of factors which uh, could contribute to a situation? Yeah, I mean, thanks for the question. Um, you're asking a pilot and engineering question. Um, I can't, I, I honestly don't know um, that technical level of detail. Um, I'll find out for you and I'll push it back through Les. Um, we do have a uh, safety data research team which is quite sizable and a few of those folk are permanently attached to the airworthiness section. I would be surprised, given the kind of importance that you, you appear to be attaching to that, I'd be surprised if we don't, but I don't want to give you a wrong answer or tell you something that might be wrong. So um, let me go away and find out. And if we're not, and we should be, then that's the sort of thing we need to know. Thank you. Uh, I can think of two other uh, uh, organizations, and that's Coast Guard and Army. They both have sizable helicopter fleets. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, okay. thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Yep. Hi, good morning. Uh, whilst I totally agree with the, with the recommendation on the category rebreather, that there's going to be an interim period where uh, the, the volume of flights is going to increase, and with that becomes a, you know, the probability of, of an event happening increases uh, with that as well? Is it something you've taken into consideration? Yeah, it, it sure is. Uh, as you can imagine, we've spent a lot of time talking about this uh, and with the helicopter operators themselves. Um, I mean, the bottom line is that the accountable managers, who are the people who are responsible for the safe operation of the helicopter fleet, um, are under remit to operate within the rules that we set for helicopter operations the risk that they sign up to in terms of, <coughs> sort of all, all the mitigations of running their airline, if we can call it an airline, and, and, and folks here on my right will have a better idea of this than me. But, but the bottom line is this. Um, we would expect the helicopter operators to say how much of, let, let's call it a surge capability for a limited amount of time, if that is required. And I think the jury's still out on that yet. But if there is a surge capability for increased requirements for pilots to fly more sorties per day, increased flying hours on the airframe itself for a period, we would expect the operators to manage that within the safety certificate, kind of shorthand for you know, the safety system that they operate, that we give them. And if, if they were not able to increase their capacity, then they would have to tell us. And uh, I mean, they're very comfortable with that. Um, as you can imagine, they're being a little coy about declaring what capacity they might have at the moment. There's a, a lot of moving parts in this debate right now. I, I'm sure they have some, um, but I don't know what it is. And there's probably people in the room who know more than me. But absolutely, we've had a lot of discussion about this. I expect them to have some capacity. I don't know how much it is. I expect them probably to be able to, what I would call surge. Uh, I increase their flight rates to make sure that the, you know, the the work program that's required for the summer, and I, I understand it's a pretty intensive one, particularly from um, you know, the, the tragic consequences of last year, so we're well aware of this issue. Uh, but it will be done in a safe and controlled manner, out with their accountable uh, requirements, and we would not let them exceed that. And, and, you know, as we, certainly for me, as I learn more and more about the industry, and, it, and it's great to, to hear, you know, Nobody's talking, kind of, if I'm the stranger in the room, nobody's saying they, 
It's all about we, which is, you know, we're already in that culture. This is a combined effort for increased safety okay, across the whole system. Um, so it is about we. And, um, and the helicopter guys are exactly the same. You know, they want everybody to be safe too. So they're in that we bit. Uh, and I'm absolutely certain that they would not, for a minute, try and go beyond what they thought their reasonable capacity was. But maybe you want to talk about that too. Okay, I've got three buttons, these other guys have only got one, so I just made sure I get the right button. Um, yeah, very much that. Uh, I mean, certainly we wouldn't allow anything to fly that, that wasn't safe, um, and that's not, that's not how we do things anyway. There is actually quite a lot of flex in the system. Uh, interestingly, the average flying hours for our pilots in, in Europe have been on a downward trend for the last 18 months, two years. So, um, you know, we're legally allowed as, as pilots to fly 800 hours a year. Uh, our current average in Bristow's, at least, for Europe is about 560. So you can see that there is flex uh, there for, for guys to work uh, a bit more during a month. Or that there are daily limits, there are three-day limits, there are seven-day limits, there are 28-day limits, 84-day limits, and 365-day limits that you have to stay within. So you can't surge too much on any given day, week, or month. Um, but we aren't using people to their full capacity uh, on those days, weeks, and months, so there is capacity for, uh, even if you know, every pilot did an extra flight every two or three days, that is quite a significant percentage increase. Um, there, are, uh, there is availability in, in aircraft to some extent, um, with aircraft not necessarily being used to their full capability. Um, the example being, you know, aircraft that are on sole use charter uh, can be normally flown four rotations a day out of Aberdeen. Quite a few are only actually being used for three, with the fourth being used as a weather catch-up kind of uh, backup facility. Um, so come the 1st of June, that's the kind of situation we would be in, and those uh, additional fourth rotations will be happening more often. So there's, you know, there is some scope. I'm not saying it's enough to, to manage everything, but there is the opportunity to do more than we are doing without stretching the system, without doing anything that we wouldn't be doing anyway we are contracted to operate those flights, it's just that uh, our clients haven't been requiring them. So the aircraft has been ready, uh, fully maintained and ready to go for that flight. Uh, the aircrew are trained, rested and available for that flight, it just hasn't been used. So there is a little bit of flex in the system and we'll just have to see whether that's enough, but certainly there's more that can be done to, uh, to ease the strain. Jeremy. <coughs> Gentlemen. Jeremy, down here. <coughs> Jeremy Cresswell, Energy. Um, category A EBS. As I understand, there is no certified equipment for, for, uh, here in the UK, um, and yet you're, you, you're going to require the industry to, make, to, to, to take up this equipment. Can you, Mr. Swan, can you explain what the certification process involves and how and what time scale we're talking about? Yeah, sure. The, um, the CAT A EBS spec was written in draft form last June. So we've done a lot of work on this already because we were conscious that we thought uh, increased safety in the EBS would be needed. Um, and events sadly proved the case. So the certification process, um, you know, the guys are pulling out all the stops to get this piece of equipment into service as quickly as possible, which is absolutely fabulous. So we will, ex we, and as you know, or you, or you will learn very shortly, that the, uh, the training requirements are being satisfied right now. Um, the certification process, actually, uh, my understanding is that the kit is, is pretty much um, the same as, as kit that's already available on the market, for example, to the military. So there will be quite a read across on some of the in basic ingredients or elements of this equipment that can be pulled across into the certification process. I think from the CA's perspective, what you're probably interested in is the approval process, which is slightly different, which is how do we say that you can use that equipment on his helicopter? Um, I'm very confident, uh, so we wrote the spec, uh, I'm very confident that that approval process, which allows whatever piece of equipment is declared to us with the training plan, with the training uh, certification that has already been gone through and is going through at the moment. Um, at the moment, I'm saying that my guys 
will be able to turn that round in less than one week uh, because we're very confident, uh, because we've been working so closely with Step Change and others, um, and I don't want to steal other sandwiches because there's a brief on this coming up, but we are very confident, with very high degree of confidence that, and we're working alongside, again, it's back to the we, we're working alongside the teams that are doing this, that um, by the time this is uh, presented to us, there is a realistic possibility that we will sign it off potentially within 24 hours. I mean, it's that, it, it's that good. Does that answer your question? I think, I, I believe so. Does, very quick supplementary, sure. I understand that the system is, is used in the Canadian sector, and therefore, I presume you are consulting with, the, with, your, with your counterparts on the other side of the Atlantic? We absolutely are. And also, you know, from the CA perspective, we're aware that a very similar piece of equipment has been in use in, in our national military since 2007. And this is actually just a, um, a slight development of that core system. Now, I don't know what percentage, com some, some may know in this room, I don't know what percentage compatibility is at 90% the same. You know, whatever it is, it's a big advantage, which is why we're so confident that this equipment is going to meet our specification uh, very quickly. Uh, and may I also say that you know, it's our spec, we wrote it, we have a degree of latitude in terms of how that spec is interpreted, provided it does what it says on the tin. So I've instructed my guys to work very closely with the folk that are running the work, where, who, who's work, doing the working group? Colin. 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 So the they're working very closely with uh, Colin and others to make sure that any little niggles and stuff, we iron out as we go along because I'm, I'm keenly aware of, you know, the focus is on the 1st of June, whether we like it or not, uh, and that needs to be dealt with. So. Jake. I'm conscious Hi. about Jake. I'll just. Uh, I'm conscious <coughs> about. Jake. I'll take one more question after Jake, and then we'll go to the breakouts. So on you go. Jake Malloy, RMT. Mark, thanks for that on EBS. Just following up on that. Can we assume that you're working closely with the ASA? We can see the Danish, the Dutch, and the Norwegian sectors adopting CAT A breathing systems. And if not, what makes us different? Yeah, we. As you know, Jake. Uh, uh, you won't have escaped the fact that Jake, Jake is on my top-level committee, keeping me straight on all this stuff. Thank you. Um, yeah, we are working very closely with the ASA, as, as you can imagine. We, we expect, and as a gentleman here mentioned, the Canadians already have a very similar piece of equipment. We expect this to be rolled out across the whole of the oil and gas sector because it is the safest, will be the safest piece of equipment on the market. and. Surely you're entitled to have that, as are your colleagues across the whole of the shelf. So that's, that's certainly the, the end we're working to, Jake, which is why I was stressing we need to pull the ASA into this and why you know, the importance of Patrick Key, the new executive director, whom, whom I know very well, uh, is key to really hammering this home because we want this to be the best safety equipment around you know, for your folk. To get to get to work and back. So, so short answer is yes. A uh, lot, a lot to do, uh, but we'll be right up there, uh, helping to make that happen. Might might take a little bit longer, but as you know, we can't mandate that. That's for EASA to do. But we're going to be working very closely with them. And actually, you know, when you see the absolutely outstanding work that's been done on this piece of kit already, I could just see it naturally flowing into into the rest of the workforce anyway. I mean, it would be crazy if it didn't. Okay. One last question. Hi there, just a couple of questions um, from the platform that I work on. Um, our platform has unfortunately had to be downmanned rapidly uh, due to a ship coming towards us. Um, in an emergency, are these rules going to apply seating wise or are we just going to cram everybody on as hopefully we would? And the other question is for some of us that fly on the smaller types of helicopters, are the pilot doors still going to be counted as an emergency exit? Yeah, thanks. Um, certainly, uh, there is no way we would wish to um, put a safety regime in place that was so strict that higher emergencies uh, were not taken account of. So look, uh, 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 maybe a kind of real helicopter pilot can answer this better than me. Uh, we have always said if there is a major emergency or an impending disaster, yes, of course, 
you would fill that thing to full and people hanging on the sides. You, you would do whatever you could to get people off. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all about ensuring the safety of life, aren't we? I mean, that's the key thing. So there is no way we would allow bureaucratic, and I'm not, as I hope you gather, I'm not a bureaucrat. I don't come from a bureaucratic background. You know, we're dedicated to safe outcomes here. So the short answer is absolutely, you do everything in your power to keep people safe at all times. And you know, the pilot in command has to make those decisions. Maybe I'll, I'll pass that on for comment and then come back to your second question. Do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, obviously we, uh, we have some scope. And in fact, it will be written into, um, so it's in the draft safety directive that, uh, that this uh, kind of uh, contingency is allowed for so that uh, we would be able to put someone in, in every seat. But it is also sort of contingent on the, uh, the offshore installation to actually declare an emergency because uh, a precautionary downman for something that is almost certainly not going to happen wouldn't necessarily be classed as an emergency. So there is there's a, an element on both sides there. Certainly for, for a real emergency, for a, a, a mayday call that's gone out, yeah, it's, uh, it's everything we can possibly do. Yes, yeah, so just common sense will be applied in the situation. That's basically what you wanted to know. So if you're allowed a second question, is he allowed a second question? If it's about good, the doors. Yeah. If, if it's good, yes. Oh, yeah. So no pressure. <laughs> so, uh, no, it was just about the 70. No pressure. Basically so, the 76. So the second question was about are, are doors counted as an exit? Yeah. I honestly don't know. Um, I know what this is. Yeah. Pilot doors. The man on my right knows. So let me hand over quickly to him. I, I think you're talking about the S76 and the pilot doors, and no, they wouldn't. They would not count uh, for in terms of having uh, a pop-out emergency exit for the passengers. That would be for, that's the pilot emergency exit, so it's not, uh, it wouldn't count for a passenger one. But I think, uh, you know, as I was, I was at pains to stress uh, earlier, I hope, you know, we've got a year to figure this out, okay? It isn't all doom and gloom, and, and clearly there's emotion, absolutely fine, but let's work through to the optimum safety for the solution for people and people to take responsibility for themselves as well. You know, it's, all, it's not all one-way street. Which is why this forum is so brilliant, because you can see that people are really actively engaged in looking after each other, which I, th I think is fantastic. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm just taking away best practice from this conference already. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of stuff we can do still, and um, we're, we're going to figure it out. And I go back to the we. You know, this isn't us, the CAA, trying to impose stuff on these guys. I mean, they'd push back like mad if they weren't signed up to the program. Everybody sees the benefits. It's just up to all of us to realize them to the best of our ability. Sorry, I better shut up because I'm using No, it's okay. Thank you. The reality is they'd much rather listen to you than me, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's absolutely fine. So, but, but thanks. Thanks for the questions. If you've got any further questions, by all means, email them into HSSG, and, and we'll make sure that we do our very best to answer them. Uh, we're, you know, we're not always fast, but we do give you the facts. You know, it does take a little time sometimes just to get the, the real information out there. So, But I appreciate the, the comments and the time this morning. So now to the breakouts. We've got four breakouts. The EC225 update, according to my notes, will happen in here. Uh, EBS and the communications stuff's going to happen in the room immediately uh, behind us in there. And Size and Shape Project is in the room 17, which is through that room, across the corridor, and in the back. Strangely enough, no, has it changed? Couldn't fit everybody you, You'll figure it out, you're grown up, so I'm going to trust you, okay? But uh, can I please, coffee will be at 10 past 10, back in here at 20 to 12, 20 to, 20 to 1, sorry. Thanks, everybody. Take care.